is used for um, encryption and decryption purposes. So next we're going to talk about hash algorithms because hash algorithms are really important when we talk about um, digital signatures. So this, that's where they come into play. So hash algorithms basically create a fixed length output out of a variable length input. So what does that mean? So that means you can take any amount of data and put it through this algorithm and you'll get a fixed amount of output. And that, that becomes uh, important later, but um, the output is called the message digest or hash. And so the main th thing around security with hash algorithms is that they should avoid collisions. So what does that mean? So that means I should not be able to take two different um, two different inputs and get the same output basically, because then there are some examples on that, but if you if, if someone can do that, they can basically um, possibly fake a signature for um, some other data than what was actually sent, which can be problematic from a security standpoint. And um, ha uh, hash algorithms are used in conjunction with public key cryptography to create digital signatures. So we'll see later on um, how that's used. So here are some examples of hash algorithms, MD5, SHA-1, and SHA-2. Um, MD5 is, is considered really insecure at this standpoint, so at this point in time anyway, so if you see this being used, that's something you can definitely consider. SHA-1 is pretty commonly used, um, especially in certificates these days. Um, so that's the one you'll see in most certificates. SHA-2 is kind of what the industry is moving towards, um, especially from a security perspective. Um, SHA-2 includes things like uh, SHA-256, SHA-384, SHA-512. Um, well, why you, you don't see them a lot, especially in public key cryptography these days, simply because there's a lot of compatibility issues with the um, operating and software, operating systems and software including some of our own, so that's why you don't see SHA-2 used too often um, these days. Um, so we talk a little bit about digital signatures and how they work. So in this example, we're going to use the example of someone signing um, an email. So in this example, Alice is going to sign an email and send it to Bob, and Bob's going to go through and basically validate the signature. So Alice creates this email, and what she's going to do is Alice is going to go through and run the email through a hashing algorithm. We talked about before, she'll send the email through the hashing algorithm and get the hash or the message digest, which is a, a you know fixed length output. So then take that hash or uh, message digest and encrypt that with her private key. Since she's using email in this example, she'll attach that signature to the email, and she'll send that over to Bob. So Bob now has to validate the signature. So what Bob does is he grabs the email, and he grabs the signature. And he runs the email through the same hashing algorithm that Alice did, and gets a message digest. Bob then decrypts the signature that Alice included in the email, Alice's public key, and then he compares his hash to what the hash that Alice previously computed, and and determines if they match. If they match, we know a couple of things. A because the key pairs worked. In other words, he was able to decrypt the signature with Alice's um, public key. He knows that the email was in fact sent from her. And also since the hashes match, he also knows that the data wasn't altered in transit. So he can believe two things at this point. He can believe one, that Alice sent the um, email, and two, that it was not um, modified in transit. And so that's the reason for using digital signatures is for non-repudiation and also um, 
from to, to ensure that the data has not been modified um, between when it was created and when the person is now accessing it. So, what does cryptography have to do with PKI? Um, well, public keys are only secure if you can validate the identity using the public key. And, and, and so this is kind of my own statement, but what I mean by that is if you can't validate who sent you the key, then you, you really have no idea, you know, you ha really have no level of, of trust because somebody sends you some information and you're trying to decrypt it, but you're not sure who, you can't really match that key to an identity and that's kind of problematic from a security perspective. Um, you can also think about it in terms of web servers. It's important to know, um, actually, like an example of SSL, if you're going to a web server, you, if you're using keys for encryption and decryption of web traffic, um, you want to know that when you originally start that conversation, all the public keys and certificates are used, that you're actually communicating with the identity that you want to be communicating with. In other words, if you're doing business with a bank, you want to know that you're actually talking to that bank and that there's not some someone else that you're actually, you know, like an attacker, for example, that's actually um, engaged in that conversation with you. Um, so really certificates, if you want to get down to the core of what they are, certificates are basically digital documents that bind an identity to a public key. And we'll definitely talk about more about this in the next session, but this is really critical for certificates. There's an identity and there's a public key associated with it. And that's really kind of, that's the core of what certificates are. We'll see there's a bunch of other information including certificates, but this is the core of what they are. Um, PKI allows you to rely on a chain of trust to validate that identity. So um, as we start to talk more about PKI, so you may say, well, I have a certificate. It has an identity in it, it has a public key on it. But how how do I know that that this certificate that Alice showed me, for example, how do I really know that that was Alice? Well, basically, the whole concept here is in terms of validation is that I received this certificate from Alice, and now I check and see where what it chains up to, and so this certificate will end up chaining into chaining to a self-sign uh, certificate, which is a root certificate. And the question is, do I trust that root certificate? So if I tr trust that root certificate to make claims of identity, for example, or to issue certificates to use it to individuals or computers, um, and, and, the, and I'll trust that identity. That's a, that's the kind of an assumption that we make when we trust root CA certificates. And then after the after later on when certificates are issued by either the root CA or subordinate CAs, we in fact trust that identity by the fact that we trust the root CA certificate. And in the other sec in the, in the sections coming up later on, um, which will be separate webcast, we'll talk about how how that validation is done and also how those trust relationships can be managed. So you can also view the algorithms in the certificate. So here's a common one. We see SHA-1 and we see RSA. So we see our SHA-1 um, hashing algorithm and we see our RSA, which is the public key cryptography algorithm that's being used. And you can see the signature actually in a certificate. For example, if you were to run, run just one cert util against the certificate. In this example, I used the um, certificate from Microsoft from Microsoft.com as an example.